Welcome, it's nice to meet all of you. My name is Lisa Niver, and honestly, I am so honored that Mark invited me to speak at the scuba show. I don't know about you, but um, I miss the scuba show. I'm happy to be back, and I'm really happy that you're all here. So thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Lisa Niver, and I run We Said Go Travel. So I've been a journalist and a teacher and a traveler. I learned to dive actually in 1990, and I worked on cruise ships, and mostly, I mean, it's hard for me because of COVID, mostly I would say um, that I'm a travel journalist, but during COVID there wasn't a lot of traveling, so there was a lot of shifting in my life, as I'm sure in the entire globe, as we know, not a secret, unfortunately. Um, but one of the things that I remember learning the most in 1990 when I learned to dive was everybody was talking about plan your dive and dive your plan because we really didn't have so many computers to use. We had tables and you had to figure everything out. And that really, really stuck with me and it's been a good life lesson for me about how to select reasonable risk. You know, we were always talking with the dive tables. You don't want to go into deco and how many minutes do you have? And it was a lot of figuring out. And those steps of figuring things out have really helped me and served me well in all of my different trips and all of my different travel careers, which I have had quite a few of. And Mark and I talked about what to talk about for this talk that people need some help sometimes to get out of their comfort zone. And during this time of COVID, for me in particular, and maybe not necessarily for you, but maybe someone in your family or someone in your dive group, that we need to practice again. We're all somewhat rusty on our social skills. I went to an event, um, a Princess Cruises event, and someone came up and hugged me, which was weird during COVID because not everybody's even not wearing a mask anymore. And she said, I'm so happy to see you. And I was like, I don't know who you are. And, and I don't, I forgot, like it, it does happen to me that people come up and know who I am, but I don't know who they are, but I forgot what I usually say. So uh, one of the things we wanna talk about is we're a little bit rusty and how do we have reasonable risks? What's reasonable to make a choice about? And so here I have SOS, which in this case we're calling state of scuba state of scuba and in the beginning um, when we first the world shut down for two weeks we weren't sure what was happening um, we weren't sure what was open and still for me I know there are certain places I'm willing to go and I'm not willing to go early on I, a lot of my friends were still diving and traveling and I wasn't I have a immunocompromised family member as many of you may and you know, certainly it's been a horrible, tragic two years with many people have died and there have been many repercussions in travel in a variety of ways. But we were all wondering, like, can you use rental equipment? Do I want to be somewhere where I'm going to be in the hospital and I don't speak the language? So there were a lot of choices. A lot of places were shut down. Some of my favorite places like the Solomon Islands are still closed. The um, Tahiti's open. Fiji's fully open, Mexico has always mostly been open, Bonaire didn't have flights, but you could kind of get there if you could figure out how to take the puddle jumper. So the state of scuba has evolved, but I think for myself and maybe some of you, we haven't completely caught up with how do we feel about where we're going. And <laughs> um, I just want to let you know I've taken hundreds of flights over my lifetime, I've spent literally years at sea. I worked for Princess Royal Caribbean and Renaissance, and the first trip I took out of Los Angeles after being home for 450 days, which is the longest I've ever been anywhere in my entire life, and I hope to never do that again, I got on the plane and I sat in the wrong seat. And the flight attendant came up to me, which is odd, and started chatting with me, which I guess was checking out how smart I was and if I was paying attention and explained to me I was in the wrong seat. And the person in the aisle moved and I stayed in the window. I sat in the F instead of A. It wasn't a big deal, but it made me realize how much I've lost, you know, small skills. Like, you know, how, what do you say when someone knows who you are and you don't know who they are? Where do you sit on the plane? I also, I don't know, it might've taken me just a tiniest bit longer to pack. I'm just saying, I might've had all <laughs> the wrong things in my bag, but it's, these are skills. 
And one of the things that we talked about with this talk is could I share some steps and some skills of how do we get back out there? Um, oops, <coughs> one way is we go this direction in the slides. So just one last thing about the state of how people are feeling. Again, people in the room, people in your dive group, people sitting next to you on the plane. This is from the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Depression and anxiety have soared 25%. This is a, a, an article from this year, 2022. So, you know, one of the things that I think is important in feeling better about our choices is really understanding what's going on, how do other people feel, how do we feel, and not feeling so alone in that. And that, you know, for myself, like I said, as someone who is ill in my family, there were certain things I chose not to do, other people I knew were doing them, but I was doing what I could to keep someone alive. And that hasn't always felt like that, that, you know, when I was in college uh, was the beginning of HIV and AIDS and, you know, there was talk about, are you gonna get a disease that's gonna kill you? But then during COVID it was like, are you gonna sit next to someone at dinner and bring something home to kill someone else? And it, I think that we need to recognize it's been a very traumatic time. And I'm really excited that everybody's here at the Scuba Show and there's so many destinations here and there's so many exciting, amazing places that we can all get back to. So I wanna tell you a little bit about my journey and how I've been practicing taking these reasonable risks. So here are some photos. This is me on KTLA TV. I have done a bunch of travel segments with KTLA for the Oscars, for Critics' Choice, about all kinds of travel destinations, the train in Canada, skiing in Ogden, all, all different really it was really fun. And then we've had a little brief hiatus is about this thing you might've heard of called COVID. Anyway, um, I first got started traveling when I was 13. My family went on a cruise in the Mediterranean. And <laughs> recently we um, rediscovered at, a, at an event at my nephew's fraternity that Someone in his fraternity's parents were on the same cruise as us when we were teenagers. That's how small a world it is. You can find the people that you went on a cruise with long before Facebook at a fraternity party in college, even though you're old. So anyway, we went on this cruise. I traveled all over the Mediterranean and it was amazing to me because I felt like my history books came to life. When I was going to school in elementary school and the teacher was talking about history, I thought it was so old and dusty and boring. And then I went on a cruise and I went and I saw the pyramids. I went to the Western Wall in Israel and I found my favorite, favorite library on the planet, Ephesus in Kusadasi, Turkey. And if you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. And if you're based here in Los Angeles, I can invite you on Friday to the Turkish consulate because I'm speaking at the Turkish consulate about global travel and um, actually also about coffee. Um, so all of those travels early on led me to study in Israel. I was in Israel on the cruise for the day. I went for a summer when I was a teenager with a bunch of students from Los Angeles. I grew up here in Los Angeles. And because I studied in high school in Israel, I ended up studying in college, I spent a semester in Jerusalem. And all of that has led me more and more into more travel. Um, my sister always asks me, haven't you been everywhere you wanna go? It's like, no, it's the most amazing thing. When you go to this one place, you find out, oh, there's this other place, kind of like it, but a little bit different, I really wanna go there next. And all of that eventually led me to scuba. And I learned to scuba dive, like I told you in 1990, when I graduated from college. And it wasn't easy to teach me to scuba dive. Um, honestly, we went to the open water. My instructor brought an extra instructor just for me. <laughs> yep. yep, I wondered why we had another person and they didn't tell me till the end. So, like I said, small steps is something I've been practicing for a very, very long time. And some of these, um, the first one, the Wall of Barracudas, that's in Sipadan at Barracuda Point. And um, the top one with the shark is actually uh, someone that's here, uh, Cuba Avalon, I went on their liveaboard. 
And the bottom one is in Puerto, outside of uh, Puerto Rico. I was filming with Orbitz for a web series. And we were not supposed to go scuba diving. And the, the head of production came up to me and was like, I need you to do me a favor tomorrow, but you're going to have to get up very early. And I said, what do I have to do? He said, I need you to go scuba diving. I said, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> so um, scuba diving definitely led me to traveling because I was teaching and I could not afford it. So I made a shift. Some people might think that you need to make more money, and some people might think you could just work for the company. So I ended up working for Club Med. My very first village was actually a ski village in Colorado called Copper Mountain. They moved to Crested Butte, but I was there in the Copper Mountain days. And the one that doesn't look super strange, that's my sister in white, and the other one is me as yeah. large. <laughs> That's Marge, the nerdy librarian, and that was my character because um, no one else was willing to be Marge. And um, it's, you can't tell from this picture, but my dad's a dentist. And um, <laughs> when my dad, my parents came to visit, one of the other GOs told my dad, when you see Lisa tonight, you are gonna wanna send her to modeling school. And so my dad thought I was gonna come out and look really, really beautiful. And I came out and I looked like this and my dad laughed so hard for so long that in the back of the geos, that's what we call the people that work at Club Med Geos, the geos were taking bets if my dad was gonna wet his pants because he, <laughs> he was like, my daughter has no teeth. So after Club Med where honestly, I snorkeled every day when I lived in the Bahamas for Club Med, but I didn't ever get to go diving because we worked every day. I moved over to cruise ships. And on cruise ships, I worked in the kids program because I'm a trained teacher and at the time, not anymore, but at the time we had to be closed anytime the ship was in port because if a child got hurt and the parents were ashore having fun, what would we do with them? So every time we were in port, I went scuba diving. So I, I did work on the Love Boat. Um, you might not have heard, but the Love Boat TV show is coming back in the fall as a reality dating show. It'll be called The Real Love Boat. I'm not sure that that's your jam, but just so you know. Um, besides working on ships, I also went backpacking. I was on two long trips, an 11-month trip and an 18-month trip. And this was the day I bet my travel partner I could carry both backpacks. Why would I do that? I don't know, but I can. I do not recommend it. Only carry your own backpack. So all of this turned into a job for me. I was teaching, I was traveling, there was the internet blogging revolution, and I started my site. Uh, some of you have my card, we say go travel, I have plenty of them up here if you want a different picture or you didn't get one. Um, and through my travels, I have been, I have a YouTube channel, I have all the social medias I've heard of, apparently there's some even I don't know about. And it's been an opportunity to find more stories and more ways to go diving. Now, one of the things that happened to me, which I alluded to when I was telling you about my scuba diving, is it turns out my whole life, I was not actually clumsy. I was known for not being so savvy, and I had a lot of accidents, fortunately. Not, well, once I was in the hospital, not horribly serious all the time, but it turns out the reason that happened is I don't see like other people, and I did not get diagnosed until I was in my 40s. So my whole life, I thought I was clumsy, and the things that went wrong when I was trying to learn to be a good scuba diver were related to, I had a near drowning and I was terrified, and sometimes I didn't hear all of the instructions. So that's kind of a different talk, because now I'm a great scuba diver, but because of having the eye problems and because of working so hard with an amazing eye doctor here in Los Angeles, we decided that my sight was vastly improved and it was time to take myself out on the road and figure out could I do stuff. And unfortunately Dr. Brodney's first idea because when you don't really see with two eyes the problem is you don't really have a lot of depth perception or perspective. And it turns out if you go to vision therapy and therapy therapy you realize it's not just that you don't see in 3D but you have some perception other issues which they'll become apparent don't worry and um so anyway we the eye doctor suggested maybe i'd like to try playing tennis which i thought sounded really like a terribly frustrating and bad idea but i did 
And eventually it turned into this project that I did, 50 challenges before I turned 50. And through those different challenges, you can see a few of them here in, in Ireland. I tried one of the oldest sports, which is called hurling. Um, I went to a bunch of different places. And what's happened over that time is I came to realize as I've been working through these 50 challenges and now writing a book about it, is it came clear there's lots of steps that helped figure out how to make those challenges more easy to manage. So one of the things when I was doing my master's in education is when I was growing up, I remember kids thinking they were smart or stupid. And when I was getting my master's in education, there was a lot of new educational theory. In particular, there was um, uh, Gardner's theories about multiple intelligences. And so with multiple intelligences, we think about there's lots of different ways to be smart. Some people are more motor smart, some people are more interpersonally smart, some people are more naturally focused on the environment. A lot of divers are very focused on how do we take care of our planet. And also at the same time was Carol Dweck's work, which is about the difference between a fixed mindset, when I fail, I think that's the limit of what I can do. I'm done, I tried it, I don't like to be challenged, that's the end, I'm picking something else. Whereas with working with my eyes and thinking through all that I knew about education and Carol Dweck's work, the growth mindset is I like to try new things, I can learn to do anything I want, and challenges help me grow. So I have worked very hard to see failure as an opportunity to grow. And certainly if I heard pivot one more time in the first few months after we started Safer at Home and COVID, I thought it might throw up, but that is what I have had to do. Um, you know, I wrote a lot during the last two years about books and technology more than travel because that's what I had as an opportunity. And so you can see here, this is a list of permissions. And I brought you some of these to think about, and maybe, would you, oh, Jeff, would you mind just passing, you can just, there's a bunch of these in here if you want to take one or take several. Um, and these are, I thought would be helpful when we're thinking about, you just hand that envelope, you don't have to walk all the way around, Jeff, but thank yeah. you. The, um, Pass it back. sometimes it's really hard to try something new and, and how do we get started? So the thing I wanna give you is some tips of what has helped me and I thought these permission slips that I found gave some good examples of how to get started. So first I wanna read you this quote from Mark Twain. The secret of getting ahead is getting started. The secret of getting started is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks, and then starting on the first one. So that is what I've had to do before I knew there was something wrong with my eyes, and since I've known, and as we go through different ways of things that have happened in life, that's what I keep on doing. So here's an example. This is me in Indonesia, and it's, not far from where the Komodo dragons are. This is the Kelly, Mount Kelly Mutu summit. There are these colored lakes. And my travel partner really wanted to go. And the only way to get there was on a motorbike. And I had never been on a motorbike and I was pretty certain I was never going to go on a motorbike. So the way we solved is we started talking about it. I said, well, one choice is we don't go. And that wasn't a good choice. And one choice we asked, could we walk there? Could we go in a car? And it turned out the only way to go was on the motorbike. So then we talked about I could wear a helmet, they could go slow. And in the end, I did go and it was an incredible day. But what really helped me was evaluating why it was so upsetting and what were the choices and was there another way that I could make it work. So, <laughs> One of the things I found when I would travel long term, because when you're traveling for 11 months, you're traveling slower, because you gotta make your budget work, and you have the opportunity to go to places you might not normally get to. So I wanted to show you where in the world, we were in Sipidan, so most of you may know where Sipidan is, since you've been through some amazing destinations and here at the show, but I always think it's helpful to see on the map. 
And then here's a little bit closer up the distance between Sipidan and Darawa. So we did travel overland, and I believe there's some easier ways to get there, maybe with a flight, but we get to Darawan. And this picture is actually from Palau, but the first time I went with this stingless jellyfish was in Kakaban off of Darawan. Now in Darawan, they told me, this is the only place in the world to swim with a stingless jellyfish. And honestly, I have to admit, I did not believe them. I did not think they were stingless. They are. But it was another one of those things where I had to really work through in my head, did I believe what the people were saying and was it worth it? It was pretty funny to me, years later I was on a press trip in Palau and they told me, this is the only place in the world to swim with a stingless jellyfish. And I said, hmm, are you sure that's true? And they said, absolutely. I said, do you find it odd they've already done this somewhere else then? They go, when were you here? I said, no, I wasn't here, I was somewhere else. Um, I know for some time, if you're interested in swimming the stingless jellyfish in Palau, I believe that um, up till around 2019 ahead, the jellyfish were disappeared for a little while. They were in larval stage, and I do think they're back. I don't know exactly the situation with COVID. I'm working on finding that out, but yes. They're back. I was there three weeks ago. Wow, that is the see, that is the best part of scuba diving. You need local knowledge. Thank you. They're back. And did you love it? Yes, it was fabulous, mesmerizing. It's a really unique thing. So, um, local knowledge is not one of my slides, but you got it anyway. Good job. Thank you. So, people always ask me with my 50 things before 50, what was the scariest thing? And for me, one of the scariest things was going mountain biking. And it happened in a weird way. Um, I am a very good skier. It was challenging to teach me to ski. It's a theme. And um, I only went because someone that I had been on a ski clinic with said, I will do it with you. And I am also scared. So I think it's a really, really good strategy if there's something you are afraid of doing is to do it with someone else. And especially for those of you who are already in destinations or running dive groups is to remember that it has been a challenging and traumatic time and that some people might need a little more help finding a buddy, being a buddy, or talking about how to make things work. The other thing that I think is really important to remind people is that they're already brave. All of us that are divers do something kind of insane. We breathe underwater. Other people think we're like superhuman, superheroes. So I think that's really helpful. And I can tell you for myself, I got invited to go on the Olympic bobsled. You can actually go on the Olympic bobsled in Park City, Utah. It's one of two in the world that are open to non well, I shouldn't say non-athletes, but uh, you know that it's you're not going to be a future Olympian. You're not practicing. So what happened for me? I don't know if this will go. Okay. So I I was in Park City skiing, and my lift driver brought me over to the bobsled, and I said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to go. And he was a former military vet, and he knew that that day I skied with someone who was blind. And he said to me, are you serious? You ski with someone who can't see at all and you won't sit behind a professional driver for under a minute in a bobsled? And I said, well, when you say it that way, it seems like I should go. And <laughs> so I did go. It's very fast. It's fun. And here's what happened afterwards. Oh my God, that was amazing. I want to go again. It's so good. Thank you, Brad. My mom loves you. I live. <laughs> So that was my driver, and uh, the driver of the bobsled, not my taxi. And when I wasn't willing to sit down, he basically looked at me like, Lisa, you have to sit down now. We have to go. And I said, my mom's going to be really upset if I die today. He said, I've done this 3,000 times. You're not going to die today. And so it was good perspective for me to, to think about this woman I skied with, um, she does not like to be called visually impaired. She likes to be called blind. Her name's Jennifer. I wrote a story about her for Sierra Club. Um, I've had lots of opportunities to work with people with different abilities. I've written a lot about accessible travel. I've skied with a wounded warrior. 
I interviewed a teenager with spina bifida, but I could only interview her in the chairlift going up because I never saw her on the slope. She just waited for me at the bottom. She's like, you're so slow. I'm like, no, you're so fast. She's going to be in the Paralympics. So she's, you know, a committed speed skier. Um, but the thing that I learned, obviously, you know, I had good perspective from my driver about, you know, everybody has different abilities. They weren't asking me to, to drive the bobsled. Um, but the other thing that I've learned over time is everything, everyone is afraid of something. And I learned this skydiving, um, which was my 50th challenge. And like I said, the mountain biking for me was harder because the mountain bike, you could fall down. And the skydiving, obviously you could fall down, but you're attached to somebody else. It's really their fault. So you just have to listen to them. So that made me feel a little less afraid, although Jumping out of a perfectly well-maintained airplane was something I never thought I'd ever do. I, I did not think that seemed like something I would do, but I did it. And what happened, this is at Go Jump Oceanside in San Diego, or La Jolla. If you're interested and you live near Oceanside, I highly recommend it. They're an amazing operation. But when I got there, the clouds came in. And so we had a two hour hole. So I had to wait there for two hours thinking about my choices. <laughs> and I was thinking it was not a good choice, but I was talking with the guides and all these people that have spent their life training to jump out of perfectly well-maintained airplanes on purpose. And he said, you know, why are you here? And what are you doing? And we talked about my 50 things. And I had just been with ProDive, who are upstairs, ProDive International. I went to shark school. And I, I went scuba diving with the bull sharks. And this guy who jumps out of planes for a living said to me, oh no, that is too scary. I was like, wait a minute, you're scared of sharks? He said, yes, I will. I'm even sometimes afraid just to go swimming in the ocean. And I started, went into my whole shark school information about, you know, more people get die by the human bite in New York than sharks in the whole world and I had all my facts from class and it was something very memorable to me that everyone is afraid of something and most people are afraid of things that are new you know maybe the first time you saw a shark on a dive you didn't feel as chill as you might feel the 12th time or the hundredth time or depending on which buddy you're with so I, I, that really helped me um, and it was something after doing 50 different, uh, 50 different challenges that was really interesting. The other thing that I think is really important in diving off the COVID rest is remembering what makes you happy, what's your incentive. And um, my dad says that I have a PhD and if you don't ask, you don't get. So I asked when I was going on a, I was going to Vanuatu for a press event called Talk Talk. And I had to fly through Fiji because I was on Fiji Airlines. And I said, well, what if I just stayed in Fiji for a few days and went diving? I said, oh, that's a great idea. So I stayed at Liku Liku Lagoon, Lagoon Resort in an overwater bungalow. And I found out that they have brought the Fijian crested iguana back from the brink of extinction. It's amazing. How do they do that? It's an incredible program. They are working with incredible people. And because I asked, and because it's fun, I got to do it. So sometimes just have to give ourselves permission. The other thing I think is really important, I know that I've had to remind myself this, I recently was on the brand new Discovery Princess, a Princess Cruises ship that just, I was there for the naming. And it was one of the first times it felt really fun to be out again, people we were, on that ship, everyone was vaccinated and tested. People weren't wearing masks and we were outside and it was just fun. And so one of my dive buddies sent me these pictures. These are her pictures from last month in Belize, um, from the Belize aggressor. She's an amazing photographer. And it made me remember I, how much I miss diving, how much I wanna go diving. I really wanna be her buddy again, cause she's amazing. Look at these pictures. Um, and the other thing is I've had some fun moments so i think one strategy is to look at your photos and remember what it is you love and why you love it this particular photo um, i was in turks and caicos on a patty uh, dive media trip and we had a, a lot of people with cameras and 
There was like a very silly thing happening on board. Um, everybody was so highly trained and, and this was a very funny moment. I did not know they were filming, um, but this is me and then Gus, who was the dive master, but not my buddy. And so we were dancing and then it became a little bit of a thing that we were dancing and then here comes my buddy. His name's Michael Clark. He's from Sandals. Oh, I guess there's more dancing than I realized. <laughs> there he is. It's kind of like that whole funny scene about, I can't pay the rent, you must pay the rent. He's like, why are you dancing with him? You're my buddy. <laughs> so um, they actually used this footage was the beaches. <laughs> <laughs> here today from Patty. Um, this was the beaches used this footage for International Women's Dive Day because it was we just were having such a good time and you know, I do think for myself and other people it's important to remember that we we get to have fun and we happen to have this amazing some of us it's a career some of it's a hobby but we all together can play in the water. So I just wanted to bring together some of my suggestions I know some of you have been taking pictures. Feel free to take a picture of this one. Anyone in the back wants to take a picture of me speaking and you want to send it to me, I would appreciate it so much. But these are the things that have really helped me. Um, I really think about what's the risk and what's the benefit and I always want to have a buddy with me. Sometimes I need them for perspective. Sometimes I need them to remind me that I'm brave. I try not to steal their any of their gear. Um, but thinking about how do you plan your day, how do you dive your plan, what's your year like, and, and to remember to have fun. And one thing that I find, you know, I started out as a teacher. And so one thing I always like to remind people of is reasonable risks. I know for myself, I personally have had issues where people have been on my social media and um, I had some problems. So I don't really Instagram, I insta later. So I just like to always remind people when I have the opportunity to think about what information are you giving out about yourself, where you are and how findable are you, and when you're traveling internationally to always know where you are. We used to give the advice on the cruise ship when I was traveling on the ship in Asia people would leave the ship with a piece of paper written in the local language how to get back to where you are. So, you know, we all have been practicing over the last few, however long it's been for you, to be carrying our COVID cards. We always carry our passports, our dive cards, but also just to be really cognizant about what information are you giving out? How findable are you? How findable do you want to be? And um, just my little public service announcement. Um, a little bit about how to find me is on social media. You can find me on everything as Lisa Niver. I also have We Said Go Travel, but I'm working on a book. It's a memoir right now. It's called Bravish, One Breakup, Six Continents, and Feeling Fearless After 50. So most of the social media I'm using now is Lisa Niver. And I'm also uh, working towards, I'm going to be part of a travel uh, accelerator course building. And my class right now is called, um, so you want to be a travel writer, AKA, how do I get a free trip? <laughs> <laughs> because that's the question I get asked the most. How do I get, a, how can I travel like you? So, um, like I said, I have on YouTube, I'm over one and a half million views. I have this website. I just sold another story this week to Wired. And if you're based in Los Angeles, I'm speaking at the Turkish consulate on Friday. I can tell you how to show up at that. And I really so appreciate, like I said, that you're all here and I'm happy to take any questions or if anyone wants to talk about their permission slips, I'm open to that too. But thank you so much for being here and I hope you all get out and go diving.